All right, hello everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, a joint project of IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the Pop Conference. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Eric Weisbard, Kimberly Mack, Francesca Royster, and Gus Stadler. Um, I'm not sure if she's joined us yet, but nevertheless, let's take a moment here to congratulate Francesca on the publication of her own new book, Choosing Family, a Memoir of Queer Motherhood and Black Resistance. You can find our whole calendar for this series on the Clive Davis Institute website under the events tab and get on the mailing list by contacting Eric. You can also catch up on videos of all of our past sessions on Eric's YouTube channel, including last week's great conversation with Mark Anthony Neal about his book, Black Ephemera. Um, we're weekly rather than bi-weekly through February. So next week, we'll be presenting Gavin Butts from the UK talking about how Leeds art students created the core of post-punk with bands from Gang of Four, Soft Cell, and Delta Five to the Mekon, Scritti Politti, and Bad Gadget. So join us then. But today, we're thrilled to be talking about Dolly Parton and other American divas with Lynn Melnick and Deborah Paradis. Lynn's book, I've Had to Think Up a Way to Survive on Trauma, Persistence, and Dolly Parton, was recently published by our friends at the University of Texas Press's American Music Series, and Deb's American Diva is forthcoming from W.W. W. Norton. I'll give you short bios for each of them. Lynn Melnick teaches creative writing at Columbia University and Princeton University, and she is also the author of three poetry collections, including last year's Refusenik, a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Her work has appeared in APR, LA Review of Books, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Poetry, A Public Space, and the anthology Not That Bad, Dispatches from Rape Culture. And along with American diva, Deborah Paradez is the author of the multi-award winning 2009 book, Selena Dad, Selena Latinos and the Performance of Memory. She's also the author of two poetry collections and the co-founder of Canto Mundo, a national organization for Latinx poets and a professor of ethnic studies and creative writing at Columbia University. As always, during their conversation, please post your questions as you think of them in the chat sidebar, and Eric will use them at the end to call on you for the Q&A. And of course, we always encourage you to use the chat for comments and conversation as well. So now please take it away, Lynn and Deb. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you so much, Eric, and everyone for being here today. It's really such a pleasure and honor to be part of the the series um which i watch um you know very very religiously and just uh, it's really such a great place to really um think together with some really smart folks so um we're going to start today in our conversation broadly about divas but in particular about uh, a very special one dolly parton um by having lynn read for a few minutes from this wonderful book um, by um, UT Press. Um, Casey's done such an amazing job of producing some incredible books uh, with some incredible authors, several of which have been featured on this very series. So we'll begin with Lynn reading for a few minutes, and then I'll read for just a few minutes from my forthcoming book, and then we'll launch into a discussion about um, divas and about Dolly in particular. Go ahead, Lynn. Thanks, Deb, and thank you for having me here. And it's just lovely to see familiar faces and new faces, and I'm excited always to talk to Deb about divas. It's really one of my favorite pastimes, so I'm glad you guys can, can peek in while we do it. Um, so I'm going to read uh, not my entire introduction, but um, from the introduction to my book, and I just want to give uh, a content warning um, for addiction and for sexual violence. Um, you might, if that's an issue, you might want to just like mute me for about five minutes. Um, so this is uh, from the introduction of the book. The first time I remember hearing a Dolly Parton song start to finish was in the triage room of a hospital as I waited to be admitted to a drug rehabilitation program in West Los Angeles. I was 14. It was 1988 and Dolly and Kenny Rogers were singing 1983's Islands in the Stream across LA's Coast FM. I knew her voice, of course. It would have been hard to be anywhere near a radio or television in the last 50 years without getting to know Dolly's warm clarion soprano. But while I grew up on folk songs, basically country for blue states, music like Dolly's was often scorned in my parents' home and by my friends. My friends and I spent our time chasing down heavy metal bands on the Sunset Strip and would not have given Dolly the time of day. 
Many people of my generation, or at least those born outside the reign of country radio, first knew of Dolly as a straight-talking goofball on The Tonight Show, a set of giant tits, someone your grandma got a kick out of, someone who, my father would say with derision, was famous for being famous. Meanwhile, Dolly had been churning out hits for decades, possessed of a preternatural talent for writing and for singing authentic emotion into every song. Class and gender stereotypes could not and would not obscure her absolute genius or stop her from going where she wanted to go. I don't remember my parents in the moment they signed me into rehab, nor their probably weary faces younger than my own now, or much of what they said, only that the high cost of hospitalization was mentioned and a joke made about hitting the annual insurance deductible in one night, March 3rd, a date I have marked every year in the 30 plus years since. As a parent of a teenager myself now, I assume there was significant pain involved, some bewilderment, but also perhaps some acknowledgement of this predictable next step in the falling apart sequence I'd been slowly enacting since I was raped by a teenage boy on overgrown 1970s carpeting before I'd turned 10 years old. Now halfway through ninth grade, I had already been expelled from school twice. Reckless behavior, followed by variously successful attempts to cover it up, was how I spent my free time while other kids studied or kissed or participated in team sports. I welcomed the stay at Glen Recovery Center. If I couldn't just be given an entirely new self, at least I wanted to make sure make it clear to the world that the one I inhabited was wrecked. Being in rehab seemed like a rubber stamp to that effect. Less fond of cocaine and whiskey than of the exhilaration of forgetting, I craved the fresh environment. My parents filled out intake forms and I was asked to create a list of people I approved to visit me. I sat with a lined sheet of paper on my lap even though I knew I didn't want to see anyone. Outside on Pico Boulevard, the Santa Ana winds blew through the tops of the palm trees visible from the window of the triage room. I could hear the traffic flow east toward the tall, vacant buildings of downtown after dark and west toward 20th Century Fox and eventually the Pacific Ocean. It was a relief to abandon whatever promise I'd held as a curious, shy girl in my brother's hand-me-down Sears dungarees and a cherished strawberry shortcake turtleneck shirt, the outfit I'd worn to school on picture day a couple months before my body was violated on that deep pile of beige shag carpet. I'd worked hard that, since then to convince the outside world to join me in giving up on my potential. But Dolly's voice from the hospital ceiling speakers held a different kind of promise than that which I'd failed to meet. It was a release, a renewal, euphoric. When I heard Dolly's voice over the four plus minutes of Islands in the Stream, I knew I needed to hear it again. Though it would be a few months before I purchased a greatest hits cassette tape from the bargain bin at a thrifty drugs, the multifaceted clarity of her voice hooked me instantly. I needed to feel that euphoria in my body again. I needed to believe in that bright precision in an artistry as unstoppable as Dolly herself. Resilience, longevity, outlast those who would doubt you, just keep going. In my darkest moments, that's been the light she's shown on me. With over 100 singles, 50 albums, 160 million records sold, more than 400 television appearances, and scores of awards, Dolly has become even more of an icon in recent years, claimed and reclaimed by fans across a startling number of demographics, and featured prominently and with due reverence everywhere from memes and kitsch merchandise to awards shows and a Ken Burns PBS series. Dolly is an icon of feminine strength and yet also an objectified caricature of womanhood. She's super savvy while often playing the rattle brain, a deflection perhaps, a feint of self-protection in a world where big talent and business acumen prove threatening when coming from a woman. She's a phenomenally accomplished artist who giggles it off as she keeps marching forward in five inch heels through the life she wants. She's an American dream. And I'll stop there. Although I noticed as I was reading that those stats on Dolly, even though the book was just uh, turned in last April, um, are probably outdated now because she's done a gazillion more things since then. <laughs> Absolutely. She has, right? And we can talk about that kind of how you manage her prolific ways. <laughs> There's no keeping up with the diva, I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's beautiful. Yeah. I can't wait to talk more about what you do in that piece that you just read and what you do after as well. So thank you so much. 
Um, I will now read for just a few minutes as well. I think it's sort of, there's so much like resonant here, I think, um, from the, um, from a few pages of my prologue from my forthcoming book, American Diva. <clears throat> the sound of a diva's voice was how I knew we were Mexican, or at least how I knew we couldn't hide it from the neighbors. My earliest childhood memories are suffused with the sounds of Vicky Carr's contralto rising from my father's turntable, spinning out past the flimsy screens, her voice a swath of silk turned out, a bandera unfurled from the window. I spent my childhood years at my great grandparents' ice house, think bodega meets juke joint, among extended family and the weekend regulars who'd lay down the burdens of their work week over beers and card games or the latest Avon catalogs. There are more than a few family stories and snapshots of me as a toddler poised on a tabletop alongside half empty bottles and discarded poker hands, surrounded by kinfolk all cheering on my efforts at dancing, always in the background of all the photos, blurry but visible, the jukebox, that played accordion-driven conjuntos or the crooning, crooning harmonies of doo-wop or the plaintive longings of Vicky Carr. Florencio, Fro, Florencia Vicente de Casillas Martinez Cardona was born along the border in El Paso in 1941 and became Vicky Carr somewhere along the way to recording artist fame, most notably for her soaring 1967 ballad, It Must Be Him. In the midst of her English language success, and not long after signing with Columbia Records in 1970, Carr convinced Clive Davis to produce a Spanish language album, Vicky Carr and Español, in 1972. This was before, as Carr the song dwelling in the moment of departure, reckoning with the end of love and the beginning of what comes after. A resignation pure and resonance and resonant, a struck bell meant to be heard from across a great distance. only other brown family lived. A voice I knew the neighbors could hear, a voice announcing our difference. Sing. We stayed outside past twilight. We turned the record over and played the other side. We knew both sides. We were Mexican. others in the neighborhood, which is to say how I came to know my place in relation to Americanness, in relation to others like me who are rarely invited to join the choruses of America's anthems. Divas help us to sing America. Or, or as, great. <laughs> this was before, as Carr recounts, Clive Davis informed her, 
I can only work with one diva at a time and I have two. So he dropped me and stayed with Barbara Streisand. In those years, when my father laid the needle down on the lead track, a plangent song called Evolvere, Car would, would pull us in with her whispered valediction, amor a Dios, and pull us out toward the swell of her overwrought command, no sufras mas. The song dwelling in the moment of departure, reckoning with the end of love and the beginning of what comes after. A resignation toward solitude and a promise of return, y volveré. I could not yet translate its meaning. Like many Mexican-American kids my age, Spanish was the language parents spoke, parents spoke to keep secrets from the children. I could not yet hear the assurances offered by its future tense. Carr's voice was clear and pure and resonance and resonant. A struck bell meant to be heard from across a great distance or at least across the street. Her voice turned up to a volume that exposed us to others. A voice heard all along the block by trim white mothers who sat around kitchen tables ashing their Salems. A voice that carried three doors down where the Irish Catholic family ate cheese sandwiches cut into right angles or up the block where until the eighties, the only other Brown family lived. A voice I knew the neighbors could hear a voice announcing our difference. We were Mexican. We were the ones who turned up the music and put dancing toddlers on tables and unfolded lawn chairs on the oil-stained driveway while a diva's voice spilled out its longings, its insistence on a brighter tomorrow. Quizás mañana brille el sol, she would sing. We stayed outside past twilight. We turned the record over and played the other side. We knew both sides. We were Mexican. I was mortified. And I was mesmerized because I mean, how could I not eventually surrender to that voice and those unabashed orchestrations supporting it? Her voice as virtuous as a telenovela maid, the strings so lush, so fulsome, so deliberate, so deliberately sentimental, so Mexican, the melodrama of it all. I was at once drawn drawn inside the cleared hollow made by her voice and deafened by its peeling truths. A beast inside the bell tower, I turned in with wonder and with shame, teeth shuddering from each strike. Her voice was irrefutable proof and proclamation of our Mexicanness. I cowered in its echo and I made it my home. The sound of a diva's voice was how I came to know my place in relation to others in the neighborhood which is to say how I came to know my place in relation to Americanness, in relation to others like me who are rarely invited to join the choruses of America's anthems. Divas help us to sing America, or as Anita once famously sang, America. The diva's voice is the bell struck and the alarm sounded, the call for gathering and the call for escape. It is as well the very destination, the holy place or the other place to which her voice leads the sound of a thing and the thing itself. A diva is often known for the ravishing power of her voice and sometimes for its tragic ravishment. Her voice is the source of her authority and her vulnerability. She contradicts herself. She is large, she contains multitudes. She holds a note and carries within it all of our dreaming and damaged and glorious and gutted bodies. Divas inspire those of us devoted to them to train our voices likewise toward the achievement of capaciousness, of maximalist flourish, of more is more and all of our outrageous over muchness to be the sound of the thing and the thing itself. Vicky Carr repeats the refrain, Evolvere, listening it again, listening to it again. I'm struck by the way the song ends, by the way it's fade out resists an ending, refuses closure. The fade out, as all of you know, I'm sure, a common practice for popular tunes of its day certainly situates the song in its particular soundscape of the early 70s. But the volume diminishing on Carr's voice as it crests with her promise of return suggests a defiance of time, a sense of the infinite. She has perhaps been singing all along, her voice carrying across a great distance. 
Listen again with me now. I'm at la long last able to translate the lyrics. Can you hear see can you hear Car sing about waiting for her lover's return? On the surface, it sounds like rather standard lost love song sentiment, her insistence on keeping as she sings in Spanish, your light shining on my path. But let's listen again. Can you hear it? Can you see it? I find myself lingering on that line, on that light, and I'm overcome by a sense of synesthesia. I blink dumbly at the illumination emanating from the sound of her voice. She keeps singing and her voice is the illuminated path. All I need to do is follow her. I can't wait for that book. Uh, well, I mean, it's so much of it's happening, right? In relation to all of our conversations and the book uh, that you just wrote and published. So I'm thrilled to be able to talk about uh, this book, which has just been, I mean, I've been able to see it on um, so many points along the way and it's yes. <laughs> tremendous work. And I'm really, really excited to hear you talk about Dolly and Divas and, and your relationship to Dolly as well. So thank you so much for being here to talk about Dolly. <laughs> well, you know, I could talk about Dolly nonstop. <laughs> I know, that's what I love about you. Um, so I would love to just start with a, very, a broad question. And, and it really is, you know, what does the term Diva mean to you? Mm. How would you define it? And what makes Dolly a diva or what aspects of the diva does she really sort of showcase or how does she expand our understandings of the role? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that a diva is someone who the world would say um, should not be making a lot of noise and then does it anyway. I mean, that's that's how that's what I would think of. You know, I mean, I think of any diva, but Dolly in, in particular, you know, she was, uh, you know, one of 12 kids who grew up in a two room home without running water. Um, and, you know, she was one of the few who, um, you know, she graduated high school and she made it out of her little town and, you know, and she, she achieved all these dreams that no one would have thought she would achieve um, when she uh, graduated at her graduation. The school was so small that each kid got to come to stand in the podium in front of the podium and say what they want they were going to do next. And she said she was going to go to Nashville and be a star. And everybody laughed. I'm not sure if they were just being cruel or if they thought it was a joke. <laughs> and then the next morning, like literally the next morning, she got on the bus to Nashville. You know, and and I think that's it's that um, that insistence on being heard and on being loud that makes. The diva combined with really like otherworldly talent like you you can you can want to be heard but not you know <laughs> be very talented and you're not going to reach diva status you have to be um someone whose talent is outsized and that is certainly dolly parton and you know and, and all of the divas really absolutely absolutely right i think it is of that combination of like yeah. a woman or sort of some feminine presenting person doing that right insisting on that particular having that kind of audacity and that virtuosity yeah i, I mean it, it it was an audacious move <laughs> to say like i'm, I'm <laughs> actually going them. to be a star yeah. you know coming yeah. from where she she came from you know she didn't have shoes in the summer you know it was just um remarkable and she none of that stopped her and it's that unstoppability i think that Absolutely. that makes her a diva yeah, yeah. I will, we, can, we can come back to this as well when we think through her persona and various ways in which she yeah. uh, shows us how to be audacious. And I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about that in relation to the title of your book, right? Yeah. Just let's, we'll start at the very beginning. Um, <laughs> so as you have, you know, tell us in the book, and as many folks may know, right, it is from a Dolly Parton lyric from the song, The Grass is Blue. And in your discussion of the lyrics in that um, chapter, you talk about how survival becomes this kind of creative act, mm -hmm. right, for Dolly. And I certainly have seen that in my own work on divas, how divas provide, and many folks who've written about divas, especially those coming out of queer communities and the divas role in, in those communities as well, talk about divas offering these kind of pathways to survival. Yeah. I'm wondering, one, how you came up with the title, but also, what are the specific ways that you think Dolly shows us how survival is a creative act? Mm. Um, I mean, I would say, well, 
to answer the first question first, I the, I don't know. It's sort of like one of those things where it just you hear it and you're like, oh, that's the title. I was listening to The Grass is Blue. I was thinking about how I was going to write about Dolly sort of in, alongside my own life with her, <laughs> you know, experiencing her music and thinking of uh, her, the first line in Grass is Blue is I've had to think up a way to survive since you said it's over, told me goodbye. And it's this really heartbreaking song about the end of a relationship. But what struck me about that line was her use of the word up. And so she says, you know, I've had to think up a way to survive. When you would kind of think she would say, I have had to think of a way to survive. And I think um, I, I believe that to be very intentional because I, you know, just knowing how Dolly writes songs, she's extremely careful. And if she had said, I've had to think of a way to survive, I think it would have implied that there is one. Um, and instead, it's I've had to think up a way to survive. She's had to create a way to survive out of whole cloth. And that's what she does here. Um, and I think her way that she survived, you know, she comes out of the trauma of poverty and also some, you know, violence in her background and just sort of surviving in a very male dominated country music scene. Um, you know, when she came up, I mean, I think like that they used to call women the tomatoes because a country radio would would play mostly men. So they were like the lettuce and the salad and then you'd get some tomatoes occasionally. And so that's, you know, that's the scene that she came up with. And so it's her like it's her really her persistence, I think, um, it, it is how she sort of teaches us to survive and how she managed to survive. She dreamed she didn't just like dream big, but she just sort of, I mean, before we all said, you know, use the word manifested so much, she was manifesting the hell out of everything she wanted. She was just sort of, um, that she kept reaching, I think is what kept her going. Um, I think we can all, since she's, now we see her all the time everywhere in popular culture. I think we've all witnessed how she, um, she doesn't stop. She is just, constantly like working and reinventing and you know not to psychoanalyze because i don't i'm not an expert and certainly don't know her personally but that is a kind of trauma response is to overwork um and to just keep going and try to prove that you can do everything and and more 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 and i um i think i think she um probably you know regardless of the trauma part of it i think for survivors of trauma, I think that's a model of like, you know, how do you keep going? You keep going. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, you know, it speaks to, I think, you know, the, that the, the kind of the creativity of it is also about for me, you know, she, she was so, and this is, you know, a question I can just move up because she was so deeply dedicated to her practice as a songwriter that I, I mean, I love that your book really attends to that as well. Um, and that seems to me to be also part of that, you know, the kind of creative act of survival was like, as, as we, I guess, as we know, as poets, right, as writers, like how the writing can also be part of that, yeah. right, for that songwriting, which has often been, of course, or at least historically during our lives, right, minimized and not until recently. Yeah, I mean, I think about, I mean, when I think about this with Dolly Parton, it sort of occurs to me to also sort of put uh, someone like Mariah Carey in that sort of diva category of people who write amazing, lasting, phenomenal songs and no one really gives them credit for it. And no one thinks of them as a songwriter, you know? And, and, um, and so it was very important to me in this book to discuss Dolly as a songwriter. I mean, I, I think of her as a poet and I, you know, one of our best, I think she is one of the most, um, important American songwriters uh, of our time. And she, it's like people are always rediscovering that. Like, oh, she wrote the song, you know, because there's so much other stuff to, you know, sort of grasp onto and I get that. But at her core, she's written so many lasting songs. Um, I mean, she wrote probably the workers anthem of the 20th century. Yes, she did. Nine to five. <laughs> like that's, I mean, she did that and, you know, and yet, she's sort of overlooked I think as a songwriter always right and even you know speaking to nine to five right which which to me that song just to say a little bit on that song for a moment because of as you talk I mean as as is now known the apocryphal story right about her <laughs> you know her her sort of fingernails right like her own persona and self-presentation right becomes part of the, the the music of that song right that it's yeah. literally made from the kind of 
diva accoutrements, right? That's right. <laughs> the sound is literally made from that, right? That's right. I mean, on the album, uh, you know, she played her her long acrylic nails. She's credited as it's as Dolly Parton colon vocals comma nails. <laughs> like, which I love. <laughs> if that doesn't make a diva, I don't know what to Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think also like one of the, the things about a diva is that they're using a lot of, you know, spangly, sparkly things to distract us from the fact that they're very serious artists. Yeah. Because that on its own wouldn't be enough and would be intimidating. And I think uh, she definitely does that, you know, I mean, she's uh, well, always all dressed up. <laughs> she's always overdressed. I read yes. an, a, an interview with her recently where she talked about a time that she uh, felt overdressed and she said she was overdressed even for her. And I thought, what must she have been wearing? <laughs> exactly. And where must she have been? Exactly. <laughs> That's great. Um, so to go back to your book, you know, um, as you uh, mentioned in the introduction and another part of the introduction, that the book follows the order initially, right, and of, of a playlist that you had made of Dolly yes. songs years before. Um, and so I'd love to know more. This is kind of like just how you how we make our our books. You know, how and when did you decide to follow the playlist, right? Mm -hmm. What mo and and also like thinking about as many of us on this you know on this particular kind of call would do is you know many of us make playlists, right? And what is the kind of motivation for choices in ordering a playlist, a Dolly playlist versus how that differed mm -hmm. or maybe resonated with how you what motivated you in ordering your chapters? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the original playlist that the book follows chapter by chapter was made in 2012. And it was just me getting on Spotify for the first time going, oh, I want to listen to Dolly. At the time, not all of her albums were on Spotify. Um, so I did add a couple later when they as they became available. Um, but at the time it was just me like, oh, what Dolly songs do I love? And kind of in like in this frantic moment, like putting together this quick playlist. Cause you know, I, I had little kids at the time. <laughs> I was like, better do this, you know, I have five minutes. Um, and so that's really how it was born is me just thinking, what are the songs, the Dolly songs that feed me most? And that's sort of how it became. And I always think of ordering playlists, like ordering a book of poems. I'm also a poet, as is Deb. Um, and just like, what is the flow? How does one, song speak to the next and how does it change how we feel about the song when they're when they're brought up against each other and so you know i i threw all those songs into the playlist and then over the next few weeks as i had time i kind of tinkered with the order of the flow of the songs and so it stayed that way for many many years and then i wrote the first draft and it was still that and then when i looked at all the chapters what had be, what had come from each of the songs uh, and uh, that became a chapter did not flow in the same way that the playlist did. Um, <laughs> so, you know, not everything gets to be perfect, I guess. Um, so I ended up rearranging the chapters to the right flow, which I learned that rearranging uh, prose chapters is a lot like arranging a book of poems. Um, and then I rearranged my playlist because I'm just such a weird organizational freak. I couldn't handle like not having a playlist that matched the book. So I, I reordered that. Um, and so that's sort of, and that's where it is now. The interesting thing was to write the book, I listened to Dolly's um, entire body of work, which is enormous uh, from beginning to, to end to most recent twice. So I did that as I was, writing the first chapters and as I was getting ready to write the book because I felt like how do you how do you become fully prepared to write about a singer songwriter that's been around this long you know she's just so much output and I didn't feel qualified unless I had really studied the song so as I did that I discovered all these other songs that I had heard before but wasn't in love with and I sort of newly fell in love and so I made a second playlist. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> and then like after all of this done, I made a playlist that's every song mentioned in my book. Um, that was just to see how long the playlist would be. <laughs> it's over 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, so we are pretty much set up for now when we need to like- If you have 12 hours of now. chores to do, I could hook you up. <laughs> I love it, that's great. <laughs> Speaking of writing, right, and ordering, you know, the thing that I, I love about this book, um, 
is how it moves, I think, across or beyond genre, right? You move very fluidly from memoir, which you read from earlier, to music criticism, to cultural analysis, right? So we go from moments, uh, and I think really beautifully and seamlessly, um, and then back again, right? You know, so that we can be in a moment uh, about your, you know, from your life that then moves beautifully into, often in the same paragraph sometimes, into music criticism or song analysis, and then to kind of putting Dolly into a broader context so I would love to hear from you, like what models you turned to as guides to create this book, right? So many folks, you know, I think are live comfortably, I think all of us do, and sometimes in one or more, one or other of those genres. How did, how did this come to be for you and what, what guides uh, did you turn to? Um, I think a lot of it, I had just sort of, um, well, there was a lot of things <laughs> that led to it. I think one of the things was just, um, again, going back to my experience as a poet and just this idea that everything is connected, you know, like in a, in a poem, you can take two very disparate things and just find their way to each other. And I think that was really handy for, for getting all of this in. Um, um, my, my editor, Casey, sent me the book, Why Karen Carpenter Matters, early on in my process, yes. and that, which is, it's a fantastic book. Um, and that was really like a, a huge guide for me and because she does weave in um, memoir with a lot of music writing, a very, very serious music writing. So that was sort of a, a key thing um, that started me off. And I think really um, a lot of it was, um, I just had the it's sort of like I, with any kind of writing, and I don't know if it's like this for you, I feel like the initial bit of writing comes from some other plane that we're not fully, uh, in touch with even if i'm like writing actual facts down i just feel like it just appears on the page magically um and then the work begins where you have to kind of relate everything and and um having never written a book of prose before my editors were extremely helpful in helping me figure out how to do that because it turns out in prose you can't just make leaps and then and then leap <laughs> like in poetry I get a poem <laughs> yeah you can't say like a big scary thing and then just run away you actually have to like talk about it it's weird. <laughs> so that was kind yeah, of like, prose. <laughs> right, I know. Like, they really make you say all these words. There's a lot more words. Um, so that was really useful to me, not just in the difficult parts about my life, but also just really in thinking through, um, you know, the music, the why of the music, the why of her cultural impact, the how, like all of this. Um, it was just getting me to stay in one place. I think that was, it was all, all these elements. Fortunately, I wrote the book uh, the first draft of the book entirely almost during lockdown of the pandemic. So I had a lot of time to do this and like, and I was really just, that's all I was doing. I was just immersed completely in Dolly and, and my kids going to school and their, their laptops, <laughs> but uh, it was just those two things. Um, and so that I think really, um, just all of that time, just, I, I kind of, I felt a little bit like I learned on the job by following models and advice. And, um, and I think like with any writing, um, you know, when it's right. And sometimes you try to tell yourself it's right. Cause you really don't want to do it anymore, <laughs> but you know, it always comes back. <laughs> and you always back. Have exactly. And I think speaking to the books in the series, you know, in, in, um, you know, the music, series at UT Press. I think there are so many models, right? You know, whether it's oh, so book, Hanif's books, like that, I think there's been now, I think such a great lineage of these books that really do fold together, I think in really astute ways, the kind of music criticism with the memoir, with the kind of cultural analysis yeah. in, in really, I think, um, inspiring ways. It's yeah, I mean, I think it just sort of makes, it acknowledges that music is like a major part of our lives, you know, like, and not just in like listening or, you know, like while we're making breakfast, but like that it impacts us in ways that we can't, we don't always think about. Um, I mean, I, I feel like along with uh, scent memory, like memories associated with songs are like the things that just move us in ways that we, that, that really um, bring us back to something. And, and, and so like, I feel like the American music series really acknowledges all of that in like all these disparate ways. I mean, it's, um, it's really amazing. I get to be a part of it. It's great. It's great. Absolutely. You know, and speaking to this sort of your, you know, this was in some ways your first foray, right, into musical analysis, right? And I think about how well you do it throughout. And I'd love it if you wanted to just talk about maybe one example or so of where you found like, 
wow, by doing the musical analysis, like it just broke open something for you and in terms of a new insight or just a way to speak about Dolly's song or, just, or Dolly's voice or, or one of her, you know, one of the moments when, you know, I, I mean, I can think of some, but like <laughs> if, there, if there, I can think of some examples from the book, but I don't want to ask you a leading question. I'd, I'd love to hear, or if you want me to come up with some, I can. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to hear what speaks to you. I mean, I will say like there are certain things um, like the one thing that comes to mind, which is less about the music and more about the lyrics, is um, uh, the song Two Doors Down, which, um, you know, is about her feeling left out. She's two doors down from this party and her, her lover broke up with her and she's all mopey. And then she decides to get up, go to the party and she finds a new love. But like, that's the song. And then it turns out that that song was actually written um, about her wish to eat fried clams at the Howard Johnson's, but she was on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, which is like I, that, like I was just when I came across that I was like I'm so glad I'm writing this book so I can tell that story all the time um, but it was just sort of amazing that she wrote this incredibly enduring song about love which really about fried clams and I love I love that artists do that like th that she would take her inspiration from anywhere is I think really um, just very moving to me as silly as that story is Absolutely. Um, and um another one that comes to mind is um silver dagger which is her cover of a um just sort of an ancient or not ancient but an old anglo tune um it's it was the only song in the book that's in the public domain so i could like quote away which was really <laughs> oh, that's great i just i, I was not <laughs> <so excited. laughs> it was very exciting um but it, it was interesting to to think about all of the artists that had um, covered it before and, and why she makes the choices she makes um, in changing the lyrics a little bit, tweaking the lyrics and in her, the song choice, you know, she sort of at one point ends of the song and there's total quiet and then there's this coda that plays just like a really mournful guitar. Mm -hmm. And so like, I think um, probably those are the two that come right to my mind. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about Absolutely. any of the others. No, those are great. You know, I think about, you know, throughout, um, and I to speak back to you being a poet as well as now someone who does you know, music analysis, that there's something I, that I really appreciated in the book that shows how like often great music analysis or, you know, criticism relies heavily on metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. to, to sort of help us see what's happening, you know, in a song when, you know, you talk about her throat rattle, right? And it mm -hmm. sounds like survival or like the sound of someone's fiddle, like, like slamming the door or something. And I think, I was so um, just so wowed often by your sort of reliance on your poetry chops, right, to kind of get us at the illuminating moments in a song, right, to kind of understand how that's how the voice is working, and that's why it gets it gets under our skin in a kind of good way, yeah. makes us want to move. Yeah, yeah, and that was sort of an interesting learning curve for me because certainly I can talk about. Um, uh, lyrics pretty well i've been teaching poetry for so long i can <laughs> totally you know uh, but um but talking about the music was definitely something new for me because i was just you know i've been a fan um like most everyone else of music um but i never really thought about what each instrument is doing and what each choice that the, the musicians are making is do are doing and um the way voices sound together so it was really just an opportunity for me to dive into something in in a new way and I think maybe coming at it from a poetry background and certainly as like someone who um you know um is not a musician myself like it was very it was just interesting to dive into some other art and and learn how it's done mm -hmm. um so more of an outsider and then to feel very much inside it the more I wrote into the book um that I was really a um sort of getting into almost her head a little bit, like why she made the choices that she makes, because she does tend to do a lot of the same moves, you know, a lot. Um, and that's, um, you know, and, I, and, and that also might speak to like the diva thing too, because I feel like with divas, like they're a little bit like, you know, a high-end McDonald's, like you know what you're gonna get. Absolutely. You know, you don't go see Dolly and, and she's not going to be like folksy and telling corny stories and singing Jolene. And like, you, so you know what you're going to get. And I think that's a, very much a, a diva thing, too. 
I, I couldn't agree more, right? That there is the, you know, and this is why she sort of fits so well with neoliberal ideas of brand, of self as brand, right? I mean, that's <laughs> part of the downside, right? In some ways, right? You get the, you know, and I think you've talked about this as well. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about, you know, the research, you did such a tremendous amount of research and kind of what you learned about Dolly's diva persona in the process, right? You know, especially with regards to like her interviews and yeah. things like that. I'd love to hear yeah, that was, um, I mean, you can imagine how many interviews she's given over the years. And I was just home, locked down on YouTube. Like if you, you will never finish watching the Dolly Parton interviews on YouTube, but I watched so many of them. You know, I ordered the Time Life um, uh, DVD set of all of her stuff. And I, then I had to buy a DVD player because yeah. I have one of those. Um, and, you know, I just, I watched so much, uh, footage of her in interviews and and read so many interviews with her. And it's interesting because in the beginning, she's very unguarded. I mean, she's still she's very young. She's, you know, early 20s when she started and, you know, giving interviews to like small independent magazines in the South. Um, and she's just kind of answering the questions, you know, like very honestly, she's obviously an outgoing person, just not shy. She's answering the questions. I think the peak of this is her 1978 Playboy interview which is just, you know, it's bananas. I mean, the things she says, you know, if she had had a, a PR person, they would have <laughs> fainted. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's a really enjoyable interview um, because you, you get a sense of who she is. Um, and then once she did nine to five and sort of be crossed over into pop music, she kind of clams up. And she herself said that was a very dark time for her. She felt she felt overexposed, I think. She felt, you know, she, people would come to her house, like they were still in the phone book. You know, it's just like she was not prepared for fame. And so, you know, she just clams up. And from like 1980 on, she gives a lot of the same interview over and over and over again. And it's like, I would watch them and just sort of like, you know, interview after interview and not get anything new. And I think, but part of that is, you know, you talk about like brand, like she basically just solidified her brand. You know, she goes on, she tells the same kind of stories in the same way. Um, and she will change facts about herself as the years go on, which is very interesting because <laughs> she'll like, for example, the, the question of whether she wants to have children or why she didn't have children, depending on when the question was asked, she, that, that has like three or four different responses, which she answers as, you know, she also sometimes tells stories from nine to five as if they happened to her, which I love. <laughs> like, she's just, she's just very, um, she's just very smooth at it. You know, you, you believe anything that comes out of her mouth. I would believe it. And I had just seen her say the opposite like 10 minutes before. Um, the thing about it is that occasionally, very occasionally, she will give an interview where she has this unguarded moment and as to someone researching Dolly, it was like a prize. It was like very exciting. Like I won that day because I got this little nugget of authenticity. Um, and while I completely 100% understand why she does what she does, she like for someone who is so universally beloved and such a diva, she has kept her private life private, like truly private. You know, there are maybe 20 pictures of her and Carl and they've been married for like, you know, 50 something years. So, you know, she's she's done an amazing job at that. Um, but it is always just very um, exciting to me to get a little too, but she gave a great interview. Something about lockdown and the pandemic, I think had Dolly feeling a little restless and she was giving some really good interviews. Um, <laughs> she gave a great one to uh, Brene Brown on, on her podcast. I forget the name of the, the podcast, but um, it's really terrific if you're if anyone's interested in listening, um, where you really get a sense of what she what what she is really like, you know, and behind the whole Dolly thing, um, which is hard to get to. I mean, you really pick up, I think, so much on. Dolly's ability, I think more than perhaps any other diva, I can think of at least kind of popular one to really negotiate artifice and authenticity in such like a, I mean, talk about creative act, right, yeah. of the self, you know, constantly being able to, I mean, as, as a diva can do, but she's sort of par, I mean, she's like the exemplar, right, yeah. par excellence, you know, that I see can happen, you know, and I think Selena, for example, did that to a lesser extent, she was yeah. younger, but that that authenticity and artifice, I think, is really, I think, part of this. What's so compelling that she is just talk about virtuosic, you know, at that particular thing. It's remarkable. I mean, I always think of that moment um, 
when Kenny Rogers passed away during the pandemic, I think it was like April 2020. And, you know, obviously everyone's waiting to hear from Dolly and she appears and she's in her house because everyone's still on lockdown. She's wearing like leopard print leggings and like a tight sweater and and like these slingback like five inch heels and she's recording this like i i'm very authentically sad um little thing about kenny and it was it was very it was it was just this one of these rare mixes where she's doing both at once because yeah. her voice breaks like she just starts crying for a second in this video and like i mean i've watched it several times but, <laughs> but um you know, and and I, as I say in the book, it's awful to watch Dolly cry. It's like watching a parent cry. You're like, no, no, you can't crack. Like, well, there's no hope for the rest of it. Um, and and so she's she's like a real person, but she's also, you know, she's in her own home wearing like you know leopard print hot pants and and five inch heels, which I support one hundred percent. Absolutely. Well, and this gets me to a question, and I think we'll begin to wrap up in the next few minutes, but I would love to hear you because so much of, you know, the subtitle of your book is On Trauma, Persistence, and Dolly Parton, right? And so much of the book, I think, really, I think very evocatively and beautifully and and with a lot of vulnerability, you know, kind of puts out there the ways that both in your life and in Dolly's own life, like those particular issues were engaged, right? Um um, or were, you know, were not engaged, but were, were, you know, were, were arising, right? And that, and that you both, you all moved through. And there's this great line from the introduction when you ask the question you ask, you know, what if Dolly is using rape culture against its own damn self? And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and about how, Do how Dolly um, provided for you that kind of, mod, uh, you know, a, a sort of a guide, you know, a guide as, as, yeah. as you or we may move through. Yeah, so you know, rape culture being sort of the the system in which uh, women are you know harassed, demeaned, um, and 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 physically harmed um, in their everyday life. So not just like when when there's severe acts of harm, but you know just everything from you know being catcalled on the street or to this idea that boys will be boys that that sort of thing that we're all fed, um, and then it's it it so permeates our daily life that it allows for more severe violence once we accept that. And I think that you know having studied Dolly so intimately and her music for so long she is she may not you know use the um sort of academic language for this but she is keenly aware of this and when you when you listen to her songs you know going back to the 60s about you know you know just because I'm a woman is a song from 1968 in which she's singing about the double standard about how you know men can have all these partners before marriage but but if a woman does then you know then she's a slut and I mean this is a song that was uh, you know released in 1968 to country radio um and really was doing the work that you know feminists are still trying to do um in and i think she was just always keenly we're also having grown up with a lot of brothers and and just a very observant person by nature she saw how the music industry worked she was a partnered uh you know on the on a show with porter wagner for nine years like she just she was she was just watching and seeing how the world worked and understood the system in which she was placed in and then she sort of, like I say in the book, used it against itself. You know, she got even more outrageous, you know, as she gets older, you know, the outfits get, if you look at her early on the Porter Wagner show, she's wearing, you know, a pretty demure standard, like 60s bouffant and dress. And then she just gets more and more outrageous, like more spangles, you know, more cleavage, bigger cleavage, <laughs> like it's just like bigger hair. Um, and I, because she knows that that's what people will talk about. And then she sneaks in you know, her lesson. There's this great moment on the on the Tonight Show um, where she talks about her, re her the region where she grew up in Appalachia and, and, and Johnny Carson makes a, a joke about moonshine. And she turns that little comment he makes into a, like a lesson on the socioeconomics of the area and why that was very, that's important. Uh, it was important to the, the, the livelihood of people who live there. And she does that kind of thing all the time and she sort of sneaks in you know important messages like nine to five um you know is this workers anthem but like i don't think people think of it that way you know because it's just a dolly parton song but we're, we're getting those messages she does that over and over and over again so great yeah this is, those are such great examples i know there's so many right and <laughs> that points to that yeah i mean she was writing about you know 
as she says, the things that were happening around her. So a lot of, there's a lot of unwed mother songs, um, you know, and there's a lot of um, sexual double standard songs. There's a lot of songs. There's, she's got a couple songs about sex work, which is pretty remarkable. You know, none of these ones that I mentioned were played on the radio, but they exist in the albums. Um, and she, and on her um, album that Nine to Five appears on, not the soundtrack, which is a separate album, but she has an album called Nine to Five and Odd Jobs. Um, she includes um, House of the Rising Sun, a cover of it, which is not one of her best covers, but that she includes a song about sex work on an album about work, I think is significant. And it shows how she kind of like sneaks things in there under all the spangles, which I just think is brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, so I think I have maybe one or more question or so, but I, you know, in the last chapter of your book, you write about several other powerful female singers who like Dolly, um, sang covers versions of Brandi Carlisle's um, The Story. Mm -hmm. And you write in it, they can push harder and go louder, but they can't dollyize it, which is to say they can't make each word so crushingly human that it hurts and soothes at the same time. I'd love for you to talk more, since we're talking about divas, right, and the particular kind of singularity, right, that divas can have, right? They're both someone who, they're both people who are like, we want to imitate them, they're like so recognizable, and yet they can never be replicated, right, simultaneously. Right. What does it mean to dollyize a song, or to dollyize anything, for that matter? Um, I mean, there's certainly going to be sequins. <laughs> 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 But uh, I mean, to do, it really is this combination of just absolute um, fierce uh, survival and just crushingly heart, like heartbreaking loss. You know, it's it, at the same time. It, and you know, I've listened obviously, as I mentioned, to so much Dolly um, that I took a weird break last fall and only listened to Leonard Cohen for like two months. I don't know what that was about, but we'll get to that some other time. And then I, I just couldn't, I had to take a little dolly break and for the first time ever probably. And then I came back to her around Christmas um, because you need hard candy Christmas to get through Christmas. And when, when I heard her, um, her voice, I actually gasped um, like, oh, I'd forgotten what this thing is that she does, which is so much hope and so much heartbreak at the same time. And she's just sort of acknowledges the entirety of humanity. And then the other thing you do when you dolly ice something is it goes over the top, right? You, you risk um, sort of like two over the top, you know, but it's a more is more thing, you know, with, I, I, as, as you mentioned in the intro, like it, with divas, it's more is more. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's how you dolly ice something. But I think the difference between like, Dolly singing the story and, you know, Kelly Clarkson or Leanne Rimes, who are extraordinary vocalists singing the story, is that bit of humanity um, that they are, that Dolly is able to impart along with the absolute beauty, you know, that all of those singers can achieve. Only Dolly can sort of crush us while she's lifting us up. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great point and a great place to kind of to sort of wind us down until we, before we turn. But thank you, Lynn. This is great. Thank you. So much about songwriting and all that. But maybe we'll have a chance in the Q and A. But it, again, always a pleasure to talk to you yes. and Dolly with you. Same. I can't wait for your book. I'm so oh, excited. I can't wait for it to be somebody else's problem. So, <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Well, thank you both. Um, before I move us into the questions that have been posed, and we have a good chunk of them, but if folks have others, feel free to put them in. Um, Deb, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the nature of your book. We heard a very composed uh, piece of writing, but a little more off the cuff, telling us sure. about what to what to salivate <laughs> over and look forward to, to in the in the months and how may, how how long must we wait? <laughs> yeah, how long must we wait? So next year, exact date hasn't yet been determined. That I actually have just been in conversation with my editor earlier today, but it is um, you know it's a book. I always you know I having written about Selena, having been trained as a, as a performance scholar, I realized over time, like, I really love virtuosic, complicated, larger than life women. And they have always been a part of my life. And, you know, as singular and as badly behaved as the diva can be, she's taught me not to be afraid of and to absolutely love really strong virtuosic women and not be threatened by them. And, and I wanted to tell that story in some ways, right? And really wanted to get at, because I think that the term diva has become one that over time has, 
as it is with women who are of a certain age making loud noises, uh, has been one, a term of derision. And I really wanted to focus on the virtuosity, right, part of that term that I think is key. And so I, be, you know, eat, I have different chapters that kind of correspond to different moments in my life when divas, um, you know, were so important. So I have a chapter about Tina Turner and my father coming home from Vietnam and listening mm. to Tina Turner. And that became the soundtrack for that particular time of our aftermath of war, as it was for Tina, quite honestly, in her aftermath that she was living um, post Ike. And I have a chapter on, um, these aren't in any particular order. It's just off the cuff, but, um, I have a chapter where, you know, when I was stuck in lockdown, as all of us were in, in, you know, these last few years, but in particular in New York during the months of lockdown, I kept listening to LaBelle's 1974 amazing album Nightbirds mm -hmm. and so I have a kind of speculative chapter where I travel back to the Met in 1974 another moment of crisis in the city and kind of imagine a world you know that that was created by them that world of touch and you know amazing amazingly virtuosic women um and so there are chapters like that a chapter on you know my love you know despite all of the trouble of Rita Moreno as Anita and how that was the way my mom and I bonded watching that so it really becomes a story, I think, about not only my love for them, but how they taught me how to be in relation to other, I think, you know, women and other people in my life. Wow. Yay. All right. We'll just have to have you back so, to tell us more about that in some, <laughs> some year, version of Pimbip to follow. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> absolutely, happily. <laughs> But meanwhile, um, our first question, usually I know who the question's from, but in this case, it's a shared account from our uh, future series presenters, Jonathan and Janet. Um, would you like to unmute and either individually or collectively ask the question? Is this the smiley? It is. Yeah. Well, I've just been noticing because I've seen Dolly on some TV programs in particular, and they keep pairing her up with Miley Cyrus. <laughs> And they seem to be like kind of vibing on the blondness, vibing on the, do you think that makes sense in terms of divaness? I mean, is Miley ready to be the diva? Just wondering how you think about that. That's a good question. I, I would say Molly, Miley's still a little young for us to, to make that call, right? Like, cause I think so much of diva hood is survivability. And so like, she's, I, I don't know how she's gotta be like 30 maybe. So maybe she's not quite there yet. I mean, she's, she's Dolly's goddaughter. And so I think they have, what's interesting about watching them together is that they clearly have a relationship outside of the stage. Yeah. And so they're, they're comfortable with each other in a way you, you used to see Dolly when she would be interviewed with Kenny Rogers like this, but it's very rare that she seems to let her guard down as she's, you know, promoting something with someone and she has that relationship with Miley. I think that's probably why they keep getting paired together. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of uh, Dolly's um, sort of fame comes from playing Miley Cyrus's grandmother on Hannah Montana, which was, I think, on the Disney Channel or something. It was on the Disney Channel. Yeah, and it was um, it was before my my kids were watching Disney Channel, so I don't really know. But um, it, I think, a, a, there was a whole generation for whom they naturally go together. Like we're over here, you know, like I'm Gen X. I'm like, huh? But like, I think like younger people are like, oh yeah, sure. You know, um, they they belong together because they've always been together. But I, I, I mean, I think Deb's more of the overall diva expert, <laughs> but my, my guess would be Miley's not quite there, but she could be. She certainly, she brings a lot of drama wherever she goes. She does, yeah. Yeah, she does. And I think it is, you know, I went, I teach, um, you know, Dolly in my divas class and my students invariably say that they're, they sort of got to know her by watching Hannah Montana. That's their generation, right? Um, and and I think that there is in kind of diva culture, you see this all the way back to opera, the kind of, there often is the performance of like the diva in, in charge who sort of <laughs> has the protege, you know, that they are often like paired with, you know, as you see that the kind of the reign, you know, will continue kind of thing. So, <laughs> I love that. you know, whether or not we believe that to be so with Miley, I think that's something that can happen, that often happens. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I also, I mean, as far as like songwriting and just even performance goes, I wouldn't say at this moment, Miley matches diva status. I mean, yeah, she's no Tina Turner, or Dolly Parton. Right. Uh, but it's part of that Disney girl diva moment, which I do talk about for a bit in my book, is like that, that there was that moment in the in the early 2000s where Disney was sort of very interested in creating 
like yeah. and girlhood in general, like girl as diva. And that Ooh, I can't wait to read that. Miley was like the model. Yeah. Miley as both character and person. <laughs> So. And and in some ways, um, having Miley in relationship to Dolly Parton is a better fate than the South Park episode that had um, Britney Spears murdered by photographers. And then in the very final scene, they're looking for the next corn harvest victim. And you see Miley Cyrus as Hannah Montana. Um, <laughs> so these, these two models definitely go the Dolly route if you can. Um, I mean, if you think about like survivability, uh, surviving that system that disney girl system she's she's she made it where it like clearly others are struggling or just forgotten so that's something yeah um let's have uh lee edwards unmute and join our gang i um i just want to say thank you so much for this wonderful discussion uh deborah i want to thank you for your fabulous work on selena and i'm very excited to read your book when it comes out and Lynn, thank you for your wonderful work about Dolly. Um, I wanted to say that one thing that's really interesting about writing about Dolly um, is the way she thinks about her own persona. And I just wanted to ask what you think a bit more of sort of what are the affordances and constraints of that? And I just wrote down, there's a quote she often gives about it being like, she's a ventriloquist. Yeah. And persona is something she's controlling She's using it as a gimmick to get attention and then keep the audience with the songwriting, but that there's times where she finds that limiting, that she can get frustrated with that persona always following her around. Um, and so I just wondered if you can sort of speak to what you think of that. And I also just want to say thanks for the, the Dolly Smithsonian picture. Um, <laughs> that was very <laughs> I was um, at the Smithsonian last summer and they had a, an exhibit of, um, Lubin and Music and, and uh, Lee's book was out. It was in the Smithsonian. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so exciting. Um, anyway, thank you for coming to this. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, when you were talking and asking the question, my thought was, um, she has this quote where she says, people don't come to see me be me. They come to see me be them. And <clears throat> I think that's part of this whole idea of her as ventriloquist. She's trying to give us what we want, which also speaks to her... Um, you know, not coming down on any political side officially, although she, as she's gotten older, she seems to have zero fucks to give now that she's like 77. But for most of her life, she was, you know, she wouldn't say who she voted for in 2016. You know, that's like, that's a move, that's a decision. Um, and so I think that, um, I think she may have finally like really grown tired of this, but I think she's always just trying to give us what we want. Um, which, you know, is something of, uh, you know, like people pleasing sort of uh, possible trauma response to things, but not necessarily just that. I think um, she knows probably that her longevity uh, is dependent on that. I mean, she, she becomes, you know, the dolly that we want. There's a dolly for everyone. So I think almost like her ventriloquism is like matching, um, matching each listener to what they want and then becoming that. And that's why I think her, she's so, it's just such an extraordinary example of, of superstar diva because she really, you know, I think we could probably name the politics and the worldview um, and sort of the hopes and dreams of like every other one of the divas, but with Dolly, like, we're not sure. She's, she's um, really hiding behind this persona that she built. And I imagine it's, it gets kind of lonely in there. Um, I mean, she has her inner circle, but I don't know if that answered the question or not. Oh yeah, for sure. I think that's that's a really smart way to think about it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Two Dolly scholars, excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Anne had posed a question and then said in the chat, don't call on me, I have to go, but thanks for a fascinating <laughs> conversation. That doesn't mean I can't relay the question because I think it's a nice topic, which is the sort of Dolly versus Cher um that specific 70s moment of a certain kind of diva figure that we might sort of see as almost like a transition from i don't know if we want to call it pre-postmodern to postmodern or who, who knows <laughs> you frame it however you'd like put your own picture on the wall <laughs> <laughs> so like my take on on that relationship i, I, mean, think, I, I think the question was yeah about the relationship between um, um, 
Dolly and Cher um, and the sort of um, ways in which Dolly was and is in dialogue with other divas who are her peers. Yeah, I mean, she de definitely seems to, you know, when she is sort of um, confronted or paired with another diva, she, there's this, this real feeling of respect, of mutual respect and admiration. I think, I, I always think like, you know, when you're like in junior high and you have to say whether you like metal or rap and that like defines your whole personality. <laughs> I feel like it's a similar thing. Like, are you a dolly or are you Cher? You know, because they, they just both, you know, and um, uh, that's, it's, it's like a manufactured um, sort of debate. You can, you can be both maybe. Um, but I, I mean, I think that her, her take on other divas such as Cher is just, you know, absolute respect and admiration for, for their, how they've lasted, you know, just like she has. It's like, you know, she she sees the, a, a kindred spirit in, in people like Cher. Um, I think, um, you know, they're very different. Cher certainly is more outspoken about hot button things and uh, Cher's a little, you know, Dolly has been married to Carl since 1966. You know, Cher is dating like a 28 year old or something right now. You know, it's a different way to diva. They have, they have different ways. Um, but I think that they are, um, I don't think it's a like a, I don't think it's a choice between the two. Like, I, I think it's more like they sort of, I love coming across photos and little video clips of the two of them together in the 70s because they are just, there's something very well matched about them because they're both entirely themselves, entirely artificial and like super real at the same time. Yes. Well, and I was going to say that they really both do that artifice and, you know, you know, like talk about plastic surgery, you know, models, but like the artifice and the real, right? Yeah. And the yeah. kind of the voice and, and all of, you know, even when it's auto-tuned like it is with Cher, but like that there's still something about a kind of authenticity there that's still, and that they also have endured, right? That they're both in their 70s. Yeah. They're both still performing. They both refuse to go away yeah right? and that there's something about that that they're they're very resonant you know and I think about the I think about Dolly performing two doors down actually at yeah. on the share show you yeah. know <laughs> right was, and I, I, I also like there's a um there's a quote from Cher where like her mom says you know you should marry a rich man and she says mom I am the rich man and <laughs> I think there's no, you know it's, it's a great quote and it's very Dolly-esque that's the kind of like standard quip and comeback that Dolly is famous for. And I think maybe, so it's like even artifice in, in how you answer questions and, and the things mm -hmm. that you will say about yourself, it's all manufactured. Yeah. Wow. Everything through a diva lens. It's a whole different <laughs> way to, to think about popular music. Um, um, Ian Mathers, would you like to uh, ask your question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, really, really great uh, talk so far. Really excited to, to read all these books when I get my hands on them. Um, it's actually something that got said after my question got asked, sort of spoke to it too, which was you were talking about how Dolly, at least for a long time, hasn't really been upfront about controversial stuff or, or political topics. And I, I was sort of asking, like, she's also very famed as a, as a philanthropist. Like, I've heard people say Dolly Parton is the only good billionaire because she's not a billionaire because she's given <laughs> money away. And I was wondering, like, you know, you're also talking about how she has all these really strong messages, worker, uh, workers and, and, and feminism and everything else. And she sort of put them in the music as almost sort of a substrate without trying to trying to have it be the the really overt text. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if, if there's any sense that like, you know, if she does a lot more now than she did in the 70s with Charity Pro, that's because she's has more money. She's, you know, been, been sort of amassing as it goes is I almost wondered it just popped in my head like, is there almost a sense that maybe she's gotten frustrated that she's been putting these good messages out there for decades and maybe maybe the world hasn't changed as much as she would have liked it to and maybe there's like more of an effort to sort of just just sort of put it out there materially or monetarily um and even because i also thought about how what with both i think prince and george michael when they passed mm. if it came out after they passed it's like oh they actually gave a lot of money to these causes they cared about but they didn't ever really talk about it and it's not that she's constantly going around going, look at what I'm doing, but it's very obviously like she has like named mm. programs about books and everything else. So that was just sort of what, what were your thoughts on that or? Yeah. That, and that's a good question. I mean, her philanthropy is a huge part of her entire thing. Like you can't separate Dolly from her, um, from her charitable giving. Um, I mean, there is a lot that we 
normally wouldn't read about. Um, and I only discovered because I read every freaking thing there is <laughs> written about her. But I mean, she has like whole wings and hospitals named for her. You know, she she's constantly like she when she sees she doesn't do it in a, in a very organized way. So when she sees a need for something, except for the book thing, um, she'll just give the money. Um, I think I mean, you know, with the caveat that it's impossible to know what Dolly is really thinking or feeling at any moment because she's so good at covering that up. I think that something during the pandemic really changed in her um, and I, just from what she has done with her money, but also like the things she has said, like she was completely shocked that when, because early in the pandemic, she released a, a song to cheer us up because um, that's the kind of thing she does. And uh, at the end of it, it said, you know, stay safe, wear your mask. And there was pushback on that. Um, and then when she got her vaccine, which she funded, um, the, the people, she was shocked that people were, that, that vaccines were a controversy. She was just completely surprised. Um, and I think that sort of added to the sense that she's, she's caring less and less. Um, you know, for the first time uh, ever in 2020 in an interview, she acknowledged being a feminist. Normally she would sort of skirt around the issue because she didn't want to upset anybody. Um, you know, she came out in, in, you know, for Black Lives Matter in an in interview in 2020. It was just like, that was a moment. And it was great timing for me because I was writing this book and I needed, you know, some an ending where, you know, like that shifts a little bit. Um, but it, like all of a sudden she never would have done these things before. You know, she she's, I always say there's a dolly for everybody because people pin what they want to see onto her. And, um, and you like, for example, I think she's, a, I've always thought, oh, Dolly's clearly a feminist. But, you know, if you were to ask someone who was like complete opposite of me politically, they would say, oh, Dolly is clearly, you know, for traditional values, you know, and they would really believe it and they would be able to make a case for it. You know, just like I could make mine. And she's, she's, I think the only thing this country agrees upon because she has made of herself this kind of like empty vessel that we can just put our hopes and dreams on uh, no matter what they are. But I think that, um, you know, she is, like you said, um, she's the, the billionaire who's not a billionaire. She's just given so much money away. Um, she's very much guided by her own Christian faith, which is a very personal faith. She doesn't belong to a church, but she really believes that that's the right thing to do. And she just sort of lives that particular belief in, in a way that I think is so remarkable because most people, you know, all these other billionaires hoarding their wealth, <laughs> but like it really is sort of remarkable to see how much, like it just came out that she had given like, um, I think uniforms to a high school band that had asked for them, like just sort of years ago, all these like bands and sports teams got their uniforms at high schools in the South because she just donated the money. And that's just sort of, I think her nature. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a lot of information. Absolutely, and, and thank you. That's some of that stuff I didn't know about either. So yeah, totally, thank you. Yeah. Her catalog of songs and her catalog of deeds. Yes. Um, <laughs> Many, and and so and over like so so plentiful on both sides. Right. We'll be sifting for quite a while. Um, <laughs> um, just one or two more questions uh, for today, um, Lucretia. Thank you, Lynn and Deborah. This is I just this means so much to me. Your writing is beautiful. Your brains are beautiful. You're beautiful. And so are divas and so is Dolly. So thank you. Um, okay, so I have a couple of comments. I'll try to be quick. One is um, just so interesting about how Dolly's humor, you all mentioned her humor. Mm -hmm. I'm really struck by how that has really helped, I think, her and us. The other thing is the term diva. You all made me see something. I mean, I consider myself such a feminist and scrutinizing language, but you know, it had never occurred to me until you two were talking about this today, how the term diva is identified with women and it's really a way to, to, to diminish what is really a powerful woman singing. So yeah. I just wanted to thank you for like, <laughs> teaching me that. And then also, I think my question though, well. I have kind of two questions. One is, how does Dolly, how does she not get angry or show us that she's angry? And then also, if we're going to construct our 
of ourself in the spangly sexualized, you know, female way. Like, are we, are we, can that be considered feminist? I'm just curious about how, I guess my questions are, how does she not, how does she deal with her anger is the answer in the title of your book, Lynn. And then the other thing is in terms of constructing uh, a, a feminized look is I'm interested in how that's almost throwing it back at rape culture. Mm-hmm. Like, can you blame me for you raping me because I wore a skirt? But all right, I'm gonna wear a short skirt and my platform shoes with a lot of spangles. I just wanted to talk about have you yeah. all that a little bit. Um, well, I can. I feel like Deb is going to be very qualified to talk about about the deep thing, but I can take the the anger thing for sure. I mean, I can answer both, but I want to give Deb Deb's the diva scholar. <laughs> um, I um, as far as Dolly and anger, you don't see her get angry that often, and and she's so controlled. I mean, I feel like you don't grow up, uh, you know, female in this country without getting to to adulthood like seethingly mad (laughs) you know and i think it's then like what do you do with it and um i think you know what she did was you know we know what she did (laughs) she took over the world but i mean you do see one of the 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 two things that i thought of were, were kind of minor but i think speak to how much power she has that she doesn't show us and 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 one of the things is uh there's a quote um from her her she's got a new manager in the last few years and he says in an interview, when you walk into a room with Dolly Parton, like the, the, the first thing you know you won't be doing is taking advantage of Dolly Parton, and you, you don't you don't um, you don't inspire that reaction by just being giggly and you know selling folksy yarns. You know you, you you she must behind closed doors present you know real real smarts, real power, um, and then this is a little sillier, but. In the book, I talk about this moment where Reese Witherspoon is interviewing her on her talk show, the, the famous women um, that have inspired her. And Dolly was her first because you know she's a Tennessee girl. And she's like, do you want to see my closet? <coughs> Excuse me. And Reese Witherspoon is like, yeah. Um, and she's holding this cup of tea that Dolly had given her. And the look that Dolly gives her as she approaches the closet with the with the tea is like, <laughs> it's just like, I, I, you you know that she's capable of great anger in that moment. It's just a second, but it's like it's. I've watched it probably one hundred times. She's like, you, you better put the tea down. And you're, like, whoa! I will do anything you say. I'm sorry. <laughs> like it's just, and and that's sort of you have when 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 sort of studying Dolly, you have to watch everything so you can get those little moments. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, so I'll let Deb take the next one. No, no, I mean, th- what else is there to say? I think that's absolutely <laughs> true, right? She, you know, in having such extraordinary control over the persona, right? That itself exudes a kind of power. And and she's and she's also like a phenomenal businesswoman, right? We didn't talk about her business acumen, right? That also becomes part of how she's able to own as much of the means yep. of the production around her as possible, right? That doesn't come from you know, she can be a, a brilliant artist and not be able to have, I mean, you know, we talk, we could talk ad nauseum about that in, in this crowd, right, with, with all kinds of artists. But I think that, that that's also been a way that she's done this. And I, and I think about, I always go back to that story and, you know, you talk about it, Lynn, others, you know, Dolly uh, scholars and writers and uh, have talked about that moment, you know, that's again, a kind of savvy and the kind of using rape culture against itself and, you know, figuring out a way to get out of a bad situation. You know, when she's trying to leave that port of the Porter Wagner show, right? And she's like, how am I going to do this? Right? And when she writes that song and she knows exactly how to play the abusive man, she's like, I'm going to tell him I'm going to love you forever. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give him the song. Right? And that was to me just like such a, it's like talk about like weapons of the week, you know, as we, you know, how she found a way to negotiate and extract herself so that she could be free financially and artistically, I think is, is that's a great example of using, right, her own, you know, and, and how the diva gets made, right, is by using those particular skill sets and deploying them in that way. Yeah. Fantastic, and she and and just to uh, be clear for the record, she doesn't give away the copyright on that song. Not supporter. Not <laughs> um, she gives the performance because she knows what to give him. Right. It's really yeah. like it, it's emotion, it's affect, it's promise. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's right. It's all of the accoutrements. <laughs> Makes total sense. All right, I'm not sure if she has a question or not, but if she does, I'd love to have her wrap us up for today. Christine. 
Sure, I, seen, I, could, I could come up with a question. I've seen, I've seen <laughs> comments enough that it made me feel, I kind of want you to ask the question you haven't quite gotten out there yet. And then yeah, we'll, I think I'm getting we'll there. Goodnight. I think I'm getting there. So I don't know as much about Divas or Dolly officially, but I, I write about Janet Jackson a mm -hmm. lot. So the, the, the conversation unfolding in the chat got me thinking about intergenerationality and mentorship. So if we're talking about um, Dolly as mentoring Miley in, in many different ways, do you, do divas have mentors themselves or divas just a sheer force? What is the narrative of diva dumb that might allow for that or occlude, occlude that? Maybe that's that's how we can wrap this up today. I, mean, I think Deb can speak to sort of divas as, as, a, as a group. For Dolly, um, I mean, she certainly had those who came before her, you know, role models. But I mean, I think the closest thing to a mentor she really had was Porter Wagner, which was in itself a troubling, you know, abusive sort of relationship. Um, and I think in part, that's why she is so generous with people who are younger than her. She's constantly giving opportunities and breaks. I mean, um, Alison Krauss was singing back up on her earlier albums before Alison Krauss broke. I mean, she was just always taking new artists under her wing, but I don't feel like she had um, any, uh, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of uh, women country singers who, I mean, I'm sure they were inspiring to her and, and maybe friendly, but not um, as, as giving, you know, and to be fair, there were very few who made it, like going back to that whole, the tomatoes on the salad, there just weren't that many out there at the time. Yeah, I think that is absolutely true. Like that, I think divas negotiate that sort of absolute kind of solitary sweet genre like they're completely like self-made in some ways kind of uh, you know I think that that is true and I think it's true that and if we look at you know the histories of queer culture right and the sort of diva mentorship diva mothers in in the houses right become like that mentorship is central to the making of divas and diva culture right certainly if you know if, you know in the history of, of of queer communities that we see that is absolutely central right the diva mother figure um in in the ballroom culture but so i think that there there is this again divas often are housing those juxtapositions and contradictions all the time right so that they are both absolutely singular and can be mentors and can throw the shade as they mentor you know <laughs> so i think that's that's what i would say about them Fantastic. All right. I think we should wrap up for today. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Deborah, for this incredible conversation that can clearly lead not only to your next book, but perhaps a few more in the room. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you come back next week, Gavin Butts is talking post-punk in the Leeds, England scene of art school with people like Gang of Four, Mekons, and Scritti Politti. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.